Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. I'm very happy uh, to be here uh, now for the second time uh, to speak about my favorite topics, Islamic bioethics, here at uh, Imperial College. I thank very much the organizers of this event, which uh, my uh, friend uh, Nadim uh, mentioned. And um, I do apologize uh, for the late uh, start uh, because of the technical issues. And, uh, but this is a good thing which uh, will end up that I don't speak too much, so I will not give you a lot of headache. And you will not have time also to ask so many difficult questions for me. So there are always good uh, sides, sides of the issue. Uh, so today I will speak about Islamic bioethical perspectives on the embryo, uh, the, the, the usually seen as the very beginning of our human life and uh, where we all uh, have started, uh, critical questions and diverse approaches. Um, <coughs> as I promised about the, um, the lecture in the, ad, uh, the ads you have received, uh, we start first by saying a few things about the field of contemporary Islamic bioethics in general in order to understand the approaches and the diverse perspectives I will speak about later. <coughs> By the second half of the uh, uh, 20th century, uh, when the, um, the wave, uh, wave of uh, new bioethical questions uh, came to the forefront almost everywhere in the world, and the Muslim world was no exception in this regard, uh, uh, up to the 80s, for about three decades, uh, Islamic bioethics faced uh, two uh, key and uh, crucial challenges. Number one, uh, in which the uh, Islamic tradition is sharing with all others. Uh, breathtaking biomedical advancements are going on. Uh, these biomedical advancements go beyond, far beyond, the traditional boundaries of biomedical sciences. What the scientists are doing in their labs what the physicians are doing in the hospitals um, uh, are not uh, um, uh, any more um, exclusively scientific, but it touches the life of everybody else. Uh, let's think about the uh, uh, discovery of the double helical structure of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick in April 53, um, uh, organ transplantation. Uh, we started to ask questions about what we are actually. What is a human being? And is it possible, uh, like in the case of organ transplantation, that we use humans as drugs in order to save the lives of humans? We know to use things from humans, not anymore from the nature, which we usually used to do. Uh, um, uh, about um, uh, 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 these types of questions uh, are, 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 are crossing over the boundaries of science uh, to raise deep questions about our ethical understandings and uh, convictions uh, of key concepts which make sense to our lives. If, if, if we will start re revising what we mean by health and sickness, if we start to revise um, 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 our understandings of life and death and our very understanding of being human uh, then it is serious. It's not a scientific issue, but it is, it is a, a life issue. Uh, so uh, science is moving and crossing the boundaries to touch uh, uh, the everyday life of everybody, the daily life of everybody, raising difficult questions, uh, which science uh, by itself cannot answer. They raise the questions, but they cannot answer them alone. On the other hand, the other uh, challenge, which make it uh, much more difficult for the Islamic tradition than others, is that we had ed an educational crisis in, 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 in um, Islamic education. Uh, <coughs> the boundaries between science and ethics are getting blurred, but in the educational system, the walls are getting higher and thicker in the Islamic education. If you, if you do Islamic studies, like what I did, for instance, in Egypt at Al-Azhar University, uh, and I did also Al-Azhar pre-university education, uh, if you want to get specialized in Islamic theology and uh, Islamic sciences, you stop having anything to do with science when you are about 12 years old. 
because you will choose the track of Islamic studies. So the, 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 the boundaries between the two domains <coughs> are almost vanishing in reality, but in the educational system, they are getting thicker and thicker and bigger and bigger. And this was not the case in Islamic education before. In the pre-modern time, we had a phenomenon of what we call jurist physician and physician jurist. Al-Tabib al-Faqih wa al-Faqih al-Tabib. And if you study the biographies of um, uh, physicians, you will see jurists among them and religious scholars. And if you study the biographies of um, uh, jurists, you will, say, you will see physicians among them. Uh, so um, um, th this made the problem uh, uh, much more serious for contemporary Islamic bioethics. And in the Islamic tradition, usually, as many of you already know, when I, as an individual Muslim, have a problem with a specific act or a specific uh, action or practice in my daily life, I want to do it in a proper way according to the Islamic tradition, but I don't know how. So I ask a religious scholar to tell me how to do it. Usually an individual question going to an individual religious scholar, you get an answer and you go further in your life. So <clears throat> these questions can relate to rituals, uh, fasting, how should I fast, whatever, uh, uh, paying my zakat, my charity, uh, going to pilgrimage, whatever. But also with the modern time, um, I want to get children. Uh, I and my wife, we have problems uh, we need to you make use of assisted reproductive technologies, IVF, etc. What should I do? I ask a religious scholar to tell me what to do. The problem is the religious scholar who would have done the, the, the Islamic studies in the modern time in which the walls between the science and religion are getting bigger and thicker and taller, etc. He will not understand what you are talking about. So it's not the problem of giving the good answer, but to start with to understand the question and then how to approach and integrate this question in, in the Islamic tradition. The problem was we have an immense tradition, a turath al-ha'il, and we have an immense change, what tagheer al-ha'il. So what bi modern biomedicine did, it, it, it has considerably changed or at least problematized the understanding of long-standing concepts. And on the other hand, the Islamic tradition had already very clear positions about these key concepts. So first of all, we have to understand what is this understanding, uh, if there is diversity in this understanding or not. So you have to understand the tradition and you have to understand the immense change which happened. This was not possible in the modern time because of the two key challenges I mean, I ju I've just mentioned to you. Uh, the, the, the other problem, which was also uh, specifically um, uh, Islamic here, is that biomedical advancements happened outside the Islamic tradition. Uh, outside the Islamic tradition geographically. Uh, so the Muslim world uh, hardly had any contribution to these uh, uh, breathtaking uh, advancements and big, and big discoveries. Uh, and also philosophically, philosophically, uh, the Islamic tradition didn't participate uh, um, fully, at least, in uh, the uh, discussions about the ethical consequences of these advancements. So this ended up having problem of conceptualization to understand the question and to understand uh, the ethical uh, um, uh, the impact on, on our understanding of key ethical concepts and the problem of language. Uh, these people who study the Islamic tradition, they do it usually in Arabic. They don't study, for instance, so when I was at Al-Azhar University, when you choose the track of Islamic sciences, you don't do English or French or whatever, uh, which is quite a problem, uh, especially at this time in the, um, from, from the 50s to the 80s, the period we speak about. What happened is that <coughs> Muslim religious scholars kept uh, depending on their tradition, uh, almost completely or considerably isolated from the modern developments. So we see books, for instance, uh, um, uh, published uh, uh, 
uh, up to the end, um, uh, the, the um, end of the first half of, of uh, the 20th century, in which people, when they speak about uh, biomedical issues, they are quoting uh, a Greek tradition. Uh, when they speak about uh, the development of the embryo, etc., they are quoting Greek sources uh, because they are mentioned in the pre-modern uh, uh, sources used by the religious scholars uh, um, uh, whose works is accessible to modern religious scholars. This led to embarrassing conclusions. So it's, it's not just wrong, it's just embarrassing. And, and it created problems for the public image of religious scholars in general. I will give a very quick example. Unfortunately, now we don't, especially now we don't have time to go into uh, these details. Uh, the life cycle of the embryo. Uh, it's very important in Islam to understand the minimum and the maximum life cycle of an embryo in order to establish paternity because paternity is very much linked to the marriage institution. So if a couple are married and uh, they um, had a child, uh, uh, shorter than the minimum duration of the life cycle of the embryo, then we know that pregnancy started before the marriage, which means that there will be a problem of paternity because paternity in the Islamic tradition is not only biological, but it's also social. There, there must be marital relationship between the couple. So, so we need to know the, the minimum life cycle of the embryo and also we need to know the maximum. So if they separated, so uh, the, 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 the husband died or they got divorced, etc., and after a while the woman said, I'm pregnant and this is your child. There sh we should know the maximum period. In the pre-modern Islamic tradition, which is, uh, uh, was based on uh, especially the Greek and later on uh, contribution of Muslim physicians, they were very much permissive about this maximum period of pregnancy. And some of them brought those up to a couple of years. Uh, because medical information at this time was not quite sure about this and, and how much uh, abnormal cases, uh, 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 how long these abnormal cases can be. Uh, in the modern time, uh, this became uh, part of uh, um, uh, folklore medicine. So you, you, you cannot mention these things in, in, in a faculty of medicine to say that uh, embryo can continue um, uh, developing in the uterus uh, for uh, four or five years. This is embarrassing. It's not just wrong, it's just embarrassing. So when you see a, a religious scholar saying that it is possible, why? Because physicians like Avicenna, for instance, who is a towering figure in medicine, mentioned that it is possible. But medicine didn't stop by Avicenna. It's, it's, it's very, very long time ago. So, so this created problems, and, and, and we have seen this even going to the courts. People will go to the court, the woman will go to the court, and the judge in, in countries like Saudi Arabia, we had similar cases in Libya, uh, giving uh, rights to the woman uh, to say that the child born after five years must be attributed to her divorcee, for instance. And, of course, the media will speak, uh, attack against the religious scholars. These people do not live in our age, etc. It, it was a big problem. Uh, so, so why? Because of these challenges that we speak about. These people are not aware of what's going on in medicine. They have no access. They cannot even read this literature. Uh, uh, and they don't know the language in which this literature is there. So we had a big problem. H how to solve this uh, problem? In the 1980s, th this, is, this is the traditional way. I, and as an individual Muslim, have a question. I go with this question to a religious scholar. The religious scholar gives me an answer, which we call a fatwa, uh, full stop. Now, it doesn't work. Uh, this one person is not qualified to give uh, this issue. And the others, like we can say, for instance, why don't you ask physicians? Uh, physicians know medicine, and they are updated. But they don't know Islamic ethics, and Islamic theology, and Islamic sciences. So, and they are not the, the usual people whom the general public will ask. So they are not in a position, their authority, religiously speaking, is not enough to give this. But we have examples uh, um, uh, in um, uh, magazines about medicine for the public, uh, like uh, a magazine called Tabibak, Your Physician. We have seen questions in, in the 70s and 80s 
uh, two physicians about religious issues, not about medical issues. And, and, and religious scholars were angry. And it was a problem because it's about authority and the power who is going to speak uh, in the name of Islam in this regard. So the solution was, uh, uh, sorry, th uh, the, the solution was is to move to the collective approach. So physicians alone cannot answer the question. Religious scholars cannot answer, alone cannot answer the question. And uh, um, uh, the, the ideal situation is to reform the education, and this will take time, and people cannot wait. So you have to find the solution. The solution was in the concept of al-ijtihad al-jama'i, what we call in Islamic studies, collective reasoning. That not one person and not one group will do it. It's something what we call now interdisciplinary. We'll have people from different disciplines, from different specializations within Islamic studies and within medicine and biomedical sciences who will come together. Uh, the, uh, the, the physicians would do um, uh, the, what we call the informative part. They will give the information about the issue at hand and the religious scholars will take this in order to integrate it in the Amin's tradition of um, uh, Islam. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, approach of collective approach, which proved to be successful um, from the 80s up till now, although there are some, they face some difficulties still, um, but anyhow, much, much better than the individual uh, approach. This approach, uh, uh, we have two main participants and two main groups participating in. Uh, religious scholars, as you see, these people dress differently, but they also think differently. So they are all religious scholars. Some of them are Sunnis, some of them are Shia, uh, some of them are um, uh, <coughs> more permissive, the others <laughs> are more strict. Some of them are uh, more specialized in theology, the others are more specialized in Islamic jurisprudence, etc. So these people come together and discuss these issues, but not alone. Also with these biomedical scientists, uh, who also uh, have different specializations, different backgrounds. Uh, uh, some of them are already based in the West for a long time. Others only did their master and PhD in the West and then they went back to the Muslim world, etc. Of course, these are the two main groups. And one of the, critique, uh, uh, one of the critiques directed um, uh, to this approach is that they are dominated by only these two groups. And the, the people usually want more. Uh, they want more groups like the, we need lawyers, the people who make the law. Law in the Muslim world is not, not necessarily based on Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, and, uh, we want to have social scientists, people who understand society. Because if you have only one medical scientist, you can fall into the trap of medicalization very quickly because you don't have social scientists who are critical to the phenomenon of medicalization. And we will speak something about this later on because it did affect the approach and medicalization was very uh, common there. But anyhow, these are the two main uh, groups uh, um, who participated. And then we had institu institutionalization of the collective reasoning of Al-Ijtihad Al-Jama'i. Three main institutions <coughs> since the 1980s um, uh, they are doing most of the work in the field of Islamic bioethics. The most productive is the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences established in Kuwait. And this organization uh, closely collaborates with two others, specialized not only in Islamic bioethics in particular, but in Islamic jurisprudence in general. The Islamic fiqh, fiqh means uh, literally Islamic law or Islamic jurisprudence, the Islamic fiqh academy in Mecca, and the International Islamic Fiqh Academy in Jeddah. Um, <coughs> these three organizations have discussed more or less all of the classics of contemporary bioethics, starting from contraceptives, assisted reproductive technologies, organ transplantation, cloning, stem cell research, up to the genetics and genomics very recently. Um, uh, uh, these um, uh, institutions <coughs> sometimes disagree with each other. So not all the time they have, most of the time they have um, more or less um, uh, similar positions, but sometimes they don't. Uh, these organizations, they are all based in the Gulf, as you see, one in Kuwait and two in Saudi Arabia, but they are not Gulf organizations. These are transnational Islamic organization. Almost every and each Muslim country is represented by one or two members. 
Um, and they are based in the Gulf, uh, b b logically, because uh, these are uh, oil-rich uh, um, countries who can fund these uh, uh, institutions. But also, more importantly, because the Gulf countries are usually the first in the Muslim world to import technology from the West. So they are the first to face these questions. So also, they have uh, interest, self-interest, in getting these answers as quickly as possible and much more quickly than the rest of the uh, other Muslim majority countries. The final point I want to say about these organizations is, um, are their um, uh, positions, even if they all agree together, the three of them, are they binding for the Muslims? Do Muslims have to follow what they say? Is it, 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 does it take a kind of uh, the position of law, binding law? The answer is no. They don't claim this for themselves. And Muslim individuals do not take it also so, whether these Muslims are living in the Gulf, in other Muslim majority countries, or here in London, or uh, somewhere else in Europe, or in the US, or in other parts of the world. Uh, their positions are usually much more authoritative than the individual positions taken by individual scholars. Why? Because uh, the, the margin of making the mistakes, like the embarrassing conclusions I speak about, much, much less than uh, those of individual positions. Uh, um, there is diversity. So um, um, if, 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 you, uh, if, you, if you are a Shia Muslim, you will find your people represented. If you are a Sunni, you will find your people represented, even the Ibadi and the others. So um, um, they uh, select usually the most productive religious scholars who are there. Uh, um, uh, people who have very good image as physicians in the Muslim world, etc. So their opinions are authoritative. Uh, can Muslim individuals go against what they say? Yes, of course. Um, it can be that they have a position, but I go to the imam in the mosque, I, uh, the, the imam I trust, and the imam says something different to me. I get more convinced. I follow what the imam says, and you remain perfectly Muslim, no question. Uh, um, can some uh, Muslim uh, countries go against their positions? Sometimes it happens, but very rarely. We will mention an example about the premarital genetic test in which the, uh, the Muslim states didn't listen and didn't follow the fatwas given by these institutions. It can happen sometimes. Um, now we go to the embryo. <coughs> embryo in the Islamic tradition has always been important. Before the stem cell research debate, uh, uh, before therapeutic cloning, before all the technologies that we have, before the age of genetics in general, it was always important. There are many references in the Quran to the embryo. And by the way, when I say embryo, I, may, I, 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 I mean the child from the moment of conception up to delivery. So I don't make the distinction embryo, fetus, etc. I, I, I know some of you did medicine and you make these distinctions up to eight weeks and from eight weeks we go to the fetus, etc. I don't do this. Why? Because this is not the case in the Islamic tradition. In the Islamic tradition we have one term which is called janin, which I will speak about soon now. So I, I will just for the sake of convenience, I say embryo and the embryo from the beginning up to the end. But of course, it's always at early stage, you know, the child at an early stage. Uh, in the Quran, we see um, um, embryo as a sign of God's magnificent creation and God's infinite knowledge, God's power. Uh, he's omnipotent. He can create an embryo, uh, 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 which humans and others cannot. And he has infinite knowledge about this embryo when this embryo is in the uterus. And humans cannot see, but God knows what's going on. So, so we have different Quranic verses speaking about this, an indication that God is the best of creators. After mentioning the different phases of the uh, development of the embryo, uh, uh, about uh, God's knowledge, and, 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 and usually understood by Muslim Quran exegetes and religious scholars, that God's exclusive knowledge about the embryo not just his knowledge, but his exclusive knowledge about the embryo. Uh, um, uh, usually, it, is, it was understood by pre-modern religious scholars that knowledge about the embryo is inaccessible to humans. The, the, the embryo is not just unknown, but it is unknowable. 
hmm? is not just unknown, but unknowable. You cannot know it because you are human. It's something exclusive to divine knowledge. And that's why the term used in Arabic was jenin. Jenin comes from the same uh, stem of jinn. So the jinn we cannot see, and the jenin we cannot see because it is hidden in, in, in the woman's belly, fi batnil um, or in the woman's uterus. So it is something hidden. We don't see it. It was usually approached by Muslim religious scholars as part of the unseen world, alam al ghaib, in which we believe, but we don't see. And that's why it was also usually connected with a metaphysical uh, concept, which is insolment. Something happened in this unseen world of the embryo, which we also cannot measure and cannot see. That's, that's the angel breathes the soul into the embryo. So the embryo was a metaphysical world, something unseen, unknown, unknowable, inaccessible to human knowledge. And uh, here is um, a quotation from Al Juwaini. Those who know Islamic studies know how Al Juwaini, how authoritative someone like Al Juwaini is. A very important religious scholar from the 11th century. He says, speaking about his colleagues, there is no dispute. There is no dispute that the child during pregnancy is unknowable. He, is, he doesn't say unknown, he says unknown. La yu'lam. Knowledge about this, 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 this entity is inaccessible to us as humans because it's something that belongs to God. So this is for Islamic theology and, and the position of the embryo in pre-modern Islamic theology. In, in, in Islamic jurisprudence, there are so many rulings, although we speak about unknowable entity, but this entity, this embryo, has so much significance in the life of the people, it determines a, a bunch of relations between um, um, individual humans, um, that there are rulings, ahkam, that guide this. In the modern time, we have a genre which we call ahkam al jinin, juristic rulings with relevance to the embryo. In the, the pre-modern time, it was always part of Islamic jurisprudence in general. For instance, when we speak about rituals, ibadat, when the mother is pregnant and she has an embryo inside, uh, practicing the fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is usually uh, uh, obligatory, will be different for her. According to many religious scholars, she can have a concession in which she doesn't have to fast, she doesn't have to compensate the days, and she doesn't have to pay money for the missed days. So something completely exceptional for the woman. Why? Because she has this um, 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 uh, sacred, uh, ambiguous entity in her uh, uterus. Uh, uh, this uh, embryo, when this embryo um, um, uh, is um, uh, miscarried, uh, it doesn't come to a full pregnancy, uh, uh, full term birth, uh, there are also rituals out of respect uh, for this embryo, like, um, like uh, doing funeral prayer, like doing the ritual washing for the embryo, etc., especially when it has some physical uh, characteristics. Also, in rulings related to the socialist sphere, uh, the relationship between the husband and wife, when the wife is pregnant and she has an embryo inside, relationship will be different. For instance, even if they got divorced, the husband has to take care of the maintenance and the financial needs of the woman, even if they are irrevocably divorced. Why? Because there is something which b b binds them together, uh, even if they are uh, completely divorced and, and they cannot come back to each other, but this line is connecting them, so he, he, the husband will have this responsibility towards the woman and the issue of paternity, of course. Financially, once we know that the woman is pregnant, there are financial consequences. For instance, if the, if, the, if the husband dies, if the father dies, we cannot distribute the shares of inheritance because we have a potential here, here, the embryo. Everything has to wait. Uh, his or her share must be put aside until we know is male, female, will be born living, um, did, etc. Uh, um, um, uh, this um, embryo, uh, all um, financial costs related to this must be um, 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 uh, carried and, and, and someone must be responsible about the maintenance of this embryo. 
uh, um, the testament. If someone wants to make a testament, you can make a testament directed to the embryo. Uh, if, when this embryo is born, I want to dedicate this part of my uh, wealth to, to this embryo. You can do this, endowment, etc. Um, pain and loss. Uh, the, 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 the value of the woman uh, when she is pregnant is not the same like when she is not. So, for instance, if this woman killed somebody and then she is sentenced to death, but she is pregnant, you cannot execute her. Why? Because she is the one who made it, not the embryo. So he cannot, the embryo cannot be held responsible, and you cannot, when you put an end to the life of the mother, you put an end to the life of the embryo. So because uh, the sanctity of the life of the embryo, you postpone uh, um, um, uh, this uh, sentence. Uh, so, uh, uh, religious scholars, in order to solve the problem of the ambiguity and unknowability of the embryo, in order to make, uh, uh, go further with these rulings, they base themselves on two things. A physical criteria, which is the gradual development, uh, when the embryo starts to have um, um, uh, limbs, um, um, physical characteristics of human beings, etc., the more, the more the embryo develops, uh, 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 the more rulings will the embryo have. And the other thing is the metaphysical criteria, which is breathing the soul, mentioned in uh, the Quran, mentioned in the Sunnah, statements attributed to the Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, usually also the hadith speak about the timing of breathing the soul, usually understood as 120 days uh, calculated from the beginning of pregnancy. So in, in uh, the, 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 the moral world, Hmm? of embryo in the pre-modern Islamic tradition uh, consisted of three main elements. Unknowability, something that we cannot know about unless God tells us something about it. Insolment, uh, again a metaphysical thing. The third, thi the third thing is gradual development of the embryo. The embryo at day one is not the embryo after 120 days, is not the embryo uh, after birth or when it comes to full term birth. So the more, the more the embryo develops, the more sanctity, the more dignity uh, it will have. In the modern time, two of the three became seriously questioned. Unknowability became a problem. Uh, insolment became a problem. Only a gradual development of the embryo was not seriously questioned. And even uh, people uh, specialized in Al-Ijaz uh, Al-Ilmi who try to approach the Quran as source of uh, um, scientific information, uh, they would even use this in order to say that the Quran said this many years before speaking about gradual development of, uh, of the embryo from Nutfa into Alaqa into Mudgha, different phases with different names. Unknowability. <coughs> Uh, especially um, 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 uh, biomedical scientists said that we have to make a distinction between that people lacked information, didn't have information about the embryo in the pre-modern time, and to uh, um, uh, uh, move this to the sphere of unknowability. So it was unknown, yes, it was unknown. But does it, does it mean that it cannot be known? No. No, it was for a time unknown which doesn't necessarily mean that it should remain unknown. It is not part of Islamic theology that embryo must remain unknowable. So there was lack of information, and this lack of information led to certain myths. People thought, for instance, some religious scholars, that before insolment, before 120 days, we don't have a living being. It's non-living being. It's, it's like um, um, an accumulated piece of uh, blood, uh, it's like a piece of flesh. It's nothing. And just after 120 days, we will have a human being. This, these are myths. People lacked information, etc. And that's why they had this problem. In 1985, the IOMS, the organization based in Kuwait, which I told you about, held a symposium on the beginning and end of human life. One of the very important uh, uh, meetings uh, which used this uh, collective, uh, the mechanism of collective reasoning, and um, spoke about it. Hassan Hathout, one of the physicians, he died in 2009, 
uh, when he was introducing the topic and uh, to the participants in this conference, he said some of the points to be presented today in the symposium, he, he says, are entirely novel. And early generations of Muslims didn't see and didn't write about it. So we have now completely new um, a paradigm. Things have changed. So don't stick to what the modern, pre-modern religious scholars said. Unknowability is part of the past now. <coughs> this, this, this is not accepted by everybody. Uh, there are people like uh, Taha Abdurrahman, the Moroccan philosopher, who finds this scientific reductionism. Yes, the embryo was not known when it comes to, uh, we couldn't see it as we now can see it. We, we, we couldn't, ev we, now we can even manipulate and make surgeries for it, yes. So as a physical, as a physical uh, um, uh, material, yes, it was unknown, now it is known. But this is not everything about the embryo. The embryo is a human being, and the human being is not only body. Human being is also spirituality, is also morality, is also ethics, etc. How do these things develop together and link to each other? We do not know, and it is not possible that we will know. So there is a part, a knowable part of the embryo, which will always remain. And according to this group, if we say that the unknowability of the embryo is just part of the, uh, of the past, we can be completely materialistic in approaching uh, the embryo. Because if we, if we realize that in the beginning it's something very small, you can hardly see it by your own eyes, etc. So you can simply come to the conclusion that it's not important. But if you know that this is the part in which um, all items of morality and ethics and spirituality, which we all develop later, it was there. Like, like it has the cells, the stem cells, all the origins of us as, as, as a physical human being. So also it, it must have these other non-physical things also from an early, an early period of time. But anyhow, I know ability was seriously questioned. About insolment, we had three, three approaches to this. The first one is marginalizing insolment, completely outside the equation. Uh, now we are in the age of science, so insolment cannot be taken as the, the sign uh, of the beginning of human life. Why? It is un un unobservable, it is a metaphysical concept, it's something you believe in, but you don't measure in order to know uh, when do we become human persons. You cannot do this. It has nothing to do with personhood. And actually, this is what Hassan Hathout says, the one I just quoted, the soul gets breathed into an already living being. We are already living beings before 120 days. We move, uh, even we can feel things before 120 days. Okay, how can we know that we are, we, we are now human beings then if, if insolvent will not be the criteria? What will be the criteria? A biological alternative, which is the moment of conception or the moment of fertilization. Once the, the sperm fertilizes the ovum and we have a fertilized ovum, we have an embryo, we have a person. Um, even Hassan Hathout questioned the, quest the issue of gradualism, gradual development. According to him, it's, uh, it's li more likely that we have a, 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 an issue of maturation not not gradualism so we have the embryo and this embryo gets mature by time so everything we have like adults the embryo had from day one the main difference is that it is there premature but uh, with us it's much more mature but nothing happens new the, the our genetic makeup our genome everything is there from day one and it gets more and more developed. So the origin of all, the, of our, all our organs, our tissues, etc., they are there from day one, and it's only a matter of maturation. But this, this was not taken seriously at this conference in IMS in 1985, even by the physicians and biomedical scientists. The other approach is that we keep insolvent as, as the beginning of human life, 
and this is when the embryo becomes a person in the ethical sense, gets the status of person, but we will medicalize this insolment. It is not metaphysical anymore because of the, of the modern information, thanks to modern science, now we can observe uh, insolment and pinpoint a specific moment in, um, uh, during pregnancy to say this is the moment uh, of insolment. What is this moment? It is when the embryo develops neural activity, a specific to human bodies, spontaneous movements. Mukhtar al-Mahdi, who is a neurologist and who participated in this conference in 1985, he said, <coughs> we, are, we are considered as, as persons, uh, one of the key elements of our personhood is that we are aware of ourselves, unlike, unlike non-human animals. I know that I am Muhammad. I know that I'm a man. I'm aware of myself. I'm aware of the surroundings around me. According to Mukhtar al-Mahdi, this happens to the embryo at a specific moment during pregnancy. When, for instance, the, 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 the movement of the embryo will uh, pass the phase of hectic movement, uh, even when the person dies, even if you decapitated someone, the person will still move, or even a chicken, or a cow, whatever. Even you, if you decapitate, uh, the being, the, the, the person can move. But this movement is not an indication of life. It's hectic. It, it is not, uh, uh, happens because the brain gives signs to the organs to move. It's not intentional when, it's not, it's not because of cognizance, drag, no. But the, the embryo at a specific moment moves and reacts um, uh, because of this cognizance. So for instance, according to Mukhtar al-Mahdi, after the 12th week, 84 days, the embryo will be able to make, to react differently to different uh, um, 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 alerts. So he will react to the voice of his mother or to uh, the voice of her father, for instance, differently than to uh, um, 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 uh, something heavy fell on the ground. Will be shocked for the later and will be happy with the first. So which means that we have here someone who is aware of uh, the surroundings, will act differently, etc. So there is cognizance and, and, and this is the moment of the beginning of human life, of having personhood, and uh, um, uh, this happens after 12, uh, 12, days, 80, uh, 12 weeks, 84 days. This is rereading the scripture because in the pre-modern time, nobody, no single religious scholar would say that the timing of insolment is, uh, is after 84 days. The, 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 the uh, overwhelming majority was speaking about 120. Only in the modern time, some people pushed this back to 40 days. That's it. 84 is something completely new. What, the, what this physician did, what this neurologist did, he went back to the ahadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the canonical collections of the statements of the Prophet of Islam, and he reinterpreted them, which is quite problematic in the collective approach, because in the collective approach, we have physicians who explain the question, and we have religious scholars who, who, who um, uh, will give in-depth analysis of the tradition to give the answer. It's not the physician who will do this. The religious scholar will do this. And of course, in, in, in the meetings, religious scholars are not happy with such um, um, trials and, and volunteering answers given giving by physicians and would say, please stick to your specialization as we also do stick to our specialization. And this is one of the difficulties in the collective reasoning. And the third one is demedicalizing the concept of insolvent. The approach of uh, Mukhtar al-Mahdi and that of um, Hassan Hathout, the one saying that insolment has nothing to do with medicine, and the other one saying insolment, thanks to modern medicine, now we can observe it, were presented in the same conference. Religious scholars were confused, and they said, look, now the unknowability of the, of the embryo, it seems now has been proven by science. Because scientists disagree, they fight with each other about what is actually the embryo, when the embryo becomes a person, so, so it didn't solve the problem. So actually, we leave this science um, 
alone and installment is metaphysical and it should remain metaphysical and we can know it only through the revelation, the Quran and Sunnah. So it was re-centralized again. Insold into you is the person. But what happened and what changed in the, in the, in the new now Islamic, modern Islamic tradition is that the position of the embryo before insolment became much stronger than before. So no opinions now saying that the embryo before insolment is actually nothing, is a non-living being. Uh, and that's why some religious scholars in the pre-modern time, for instance, they said aborting the embryo before insolment can be done even without any reason. Why? Because you are not putting an end to life, not to mention human life. There is no life whatsoever. It, it, it's like vomiting blood. Uh, it's, it's nothing. Because of the, of, the, of the modern science now, they know that it's not. So th th there, was, there was no possibility now to say, okay, it, it still has the same status. So they, they said, before insol after insolment, we have a human being, no question, with full human dignity. But before this, we cannot say, we cannot say it's the same. Why? Because of insolment. Insolment must make difference. What would be before insolment? Before insolment is a life which morally matters but it's not human life. And the dignity of the embryo before insolment is not the same dignity uh, uh, for an embryo after insolment. And then we had the age of genetics. We moved from knowing the embryo to managing the embryo, to controlling the embryo, to designing the embryo more or less. Uh, so, so it's not only about, about, about knowing, but about doing. And, and now even we are moving into gene editing and design babies. The Pandora's box has opened and we don't know where it will lead us at the end. Uh, so um, we had the issues of premarital pre genetic tests. We know that genetic diseases happen because we have two carriers or maybe one of them. And that's why this will go to the embryo. Can we prevent this before? in order to get a good, strong, healthy embryo? Yes, we can through premarital pre genetic tests. Should, should we do this? Th this was a relevant question for Islam because there is no possibility from an Islamic perspective, pers pers perspective to get children without marriage. So you have to have married couple. And uh, socially speaking, it's very relevant for Muslim majority countries, specifically in the Gulf region, for instance, and many uh, um, um, segments of Muslim minorities in those because of consanguinity. And there is a kind of co, um, uh, we call it um, um, co-relationship, or not necessarily cause effect, but correlation between consanguinity and genetic diseases. So can we do this in order to prevent the frequency of genetic diseases? This was a question. Um, uh, they got married already, and we may get an embryo with a disease. Can we check this? We, we do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in the IVF process, for instance, in order to select still the healthy one. We made the embryo. Can we choose the good one? And good one here is not only the healthy, but the good one can be, for instance, male or female. Can we do this? These were all new questions we didn't have before. We couldn't see the embryo before implantation. Now we can. We have it in a petri dish, and we have many, and we can choose. Uh, um, can we do therapeutic cloning and stem cell research? Can we study the embryo? And, 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 and study um, uh, the, the working and the mechanism of stem cell there, or we take the stem cell and by which we kill the embryo in order to save the, li the lives of, of people who are already living? These are, again, all new questions. Uh, if we didn't succeed in all this to uh, avoid having uh, um, um, uh, um, an embryo which has not have good quality, can we abort it? Uh, can we abort the, the, the bad embryos, the weak embryos? Now for valid reasons, because we said before insolvent now, it has a life which morally matters, but it's not human life. So the possibility before insolvent is not the same possibility after insolvent. What happened in order to, 
avoid uh, taking too much time. Uh, we have here tomor uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, I'm coming here for three days, so tomorrow after and after tomorrow, we'll have uh, intensive course on Islam and bioethics, and I will speak about these things in details. Unfortunately, today I cannot do all, all this. Anyhow, considerably permissive positions we have in the modern time, in all the questions I mentioned. So when it comes to premarital genetic tests, almost all these collective organizations, they said, yes, you can do this, on the condition that they are not obligatory. You give the option to the people, and people can choose to do it or not. You cannot make one of the conditions of marriage that people will do the tests. Why? Because marriage is a religious contract. It's not just a civil. And the conditions of marriage are mentioned in the Quran and so now we cannot add new one to them now. That's genetic testing. What happened in the Gulf countries at least and many of the Muslim countries, now it's binding. You have to do the premarital genetic tests. If you, are, if you are living in Qatar, even if you are not a Qatari or if you are living in Saudi Arabia, if you are a resident and you want to get a marriage certificate, you cannot get the marriage certificate without doing the premarital genetic tests. But the difference is the results of the genetic tests are not binding for you. I imagine that the, the results are negative. And still, you want to get married with each other, okay, nobody will um, interfere. But you have to do it, and you have to know the results. Um, so th this is one of the things in which the laws, codified laws, didn't go in line with the fatwas of these um, collective institutions. About stem cell research and therapeutic cl cloning, the same. The only condition is that the source is lawful. So for instance, you will not initiate pregnancy and abort it in order to have embryonic stem cells. This is not possible. Why? Because abortion is illegal. Uh, because there is no valid reason. Um, um, so you, you should have the embryos from a legal source that uh, a spontaneous miscarriage happened, IVF uh, process, and we have embryos which cannot be implanted because they have genetic problems. The, from these sources you can use. Uh, about um, uh, deformed, deformed embryos, weak embryos, unhealthy embryos, uh, um, can, can we abort them? Also, again, the organization in Mecca in 1990 said you can, as long as you have strong medical report made by more than one, the parents will consent and will ask this. The embryo does not have uh, a good uh, chance for uh, quality of life, etc. Why, why, the, why, why were the majority of Muslim religious scholars so permissive with all these new things? To my mind, mainly because of two things. Th there are two elements which survived. I, I told you about three, three things which uh, um, govern the moral world of the embryo. Unknowability, insolment, and gradualism. Unknowability disappeared because not only knowing, but now we can manage. But insolment remained, and insolment does not happen on day one, according to the overwhelming majority. It's either 40 or 120, according to the modern scholars, according to the pre-moderns, 120. And um, graduality, so the, the status of the embryo on day one is not the status on day two, in on, the th on day three, etc. So the, 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 the more you go to the beginning of pregnancy, the less the dignity of the embryo is. And also because of the medicalization. I mentioned that we have two only groups, religious scholars and biomedical scientists, no social scientists. So a heavy phenomenon of medicalization was there. So there is a benefit, there is maslaha. Uh, uh, we will improve the quality of life of, of, of the, of the uh, newborn babies. We will improve uh, the quality of life of people living in our countries and in our world. Why don't we do this if we can? Why don't we uh, avoid uh, the problematic embryos if we can do this? As long as we don't kill human beings. They are just pre insolment embryos. Now I come to the, my final and concluding remarks. It's, it's as if I'm running to give you the information <laughs> I want to give and also to give you some space for um, um, uh, raising questions. I, I think we are going well now. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, the first thing and the main thing is that biomedical advancements are ins inseparably linked with 
uh, parallel developments in ethical reasoning. So what, whatever happens in biology and biomedical sciences will affect the ethical reasoning. Even the mechanism, not to mention answering the question, the mechanism of addressing the questions, we have seen that it has radically changed uh, after the new biomedical advancements. Uh, the, the role of individual religious scholars dramatically decreased, dramatically decreased. And now we have physicians who are playing a new role in the Islamic tradition. Usually physicians are there to give you good drugs and good medical treatments. Not, not to formulate the ethical position about things. Usually they are in the clinic, you see them, they give you good medicine and you are happy. Now they have a social role, they come on television, they speak about these things, so they, have, they are much more socially engaged. So biomedical advancements affect ethical reasoning, no question about this. Not in this lecture, but in other topics, I could also speak about the impact of ethical reasoning on biomedical advancements as well. So th these, these, these uh, uh, institutions, for instance, they didn't permit uh, establishing milk banks, banks which uh, preserve uh, um, a mother milk uh, to give it to premature baby babies, etc. They didn't approve this. No single milk bank is established in the Muslim world till now, although the discussion started in the 80s. Why? Because the, the, the uh, uh, ethical landscape is not welcoming this. And, and nowadays in Qatar, we are discussing how to um, uh, um, accommodate these objections about uh, uh, mother milk banks. So there is bilateral uh, influence, I would say. But anyhow, for this one, we say that biomedical advancement do affect uh, uh, the ethical approach uh, to the questions raised by biomedicine. Uh, now the critical things about what I mentioned to you uh, about the religious scholars and embryo in the age of genetics. The key question at stake was usually in the mindset of the religious scholars and the physicians when they were discussing these issues was, when does human life begin? Not when does life morally matter, start to morally matter, no. Although they said before insolment, we have a life which morally matters, but surely this, this was not the key question. So the key question was legal. The key question was not ethical about when, when does life start to morally matter. It was a legal one. When does human life begin? When your action will be killing and when your action will not be killing. That's it. And this makes a huge difference in the approach. Your key, if your key question and starting question is this, you can lead to this conclusion, and if your quick question in this is, is leading to other conclusions. The absence of social science also had a great impact on the discussions, uh, because what is the impact of these positions on society? You can say, um, uh, methodologically speaking, when it comes to religious, uh, when it comes to Islamic jurisprudence, there is nothing wrong. So it fits uh, when, when we check, when we do the checks and balances, it's okay. There is nothing forbidden done. But what about the, the impact on society on the long term specifically? This is something to be thought of and measured by social scientists who are not there, which makes a problem. Let's take some examples. When we speak about premarital genetic testing, we have a couple who want to get married. We do testing for them, genetic testing for them. If one of them is a carrier of, 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 of a gene mutation, which has pathological uh, consequences, you have to declare this to the other partner. And, and this, of course, will, will undermine the, the marriage opportunities. So the question is, is this person sick? This carrier of gene mutation, is he or she sick? If yes, it has consequences, and if no, it has other consequences. And if we speak about Muslim societies, whether in Muslim majority countries or uh, uh, in Europe or in, uh, in uh, uh, somewhere else, we know that people cannot get children outside marriage, at least theoretically. So what should these people do if, if they are carriers of gene mutation? Th these things are not discussed. Uh, what about genetic discrimination? 
especially when it comes to genetics, your information is, is not telling something about you. It's telling about you plus others. We know that our genomes, uh, we have a great deal of our genomes, 99% uh, shared and more shared with your relatives and more shared with your blood relatives and more shared with your brothers and sisters and father and mother. So when you, you do the genetic testing, so imagine I'm going to get married with X woman from this family and we had the premarital genetic test and she was carrier. And I knew this because I'm the partner, at least future partner. And then there is another one who wanted to get with X from, an, from the same family and she was also a carrier. This will, be, this will be discussed in the community. And this family will be in problem. Most of the time, genetic discrimination in Western context, it's about employment and about health insurance. In the Gulf region, this is not an issue at all. Neither employment uh, no <laughs> nor health insurance. Everybody is covered. I, I, I am fully covered health insurance because I'm, I'm working there. If you, are, if you are a citizen, you are covered by the government. If you are not citizen, you have to be covered by your employer. So there is no question about uh, these issues of health insurance. But it's about marriage. If these, if these families, and they are extended families, if there are even rumors, just rumors, that these people are carriers of gene mutation, they will give you bad babies. You will have a serious problem. This is what we call in the modern time molecule identity. So your identity will not be determined through the big family you belong to, but through you have strong or weak genes. That's it. If you have good genes, you will get married. If you have bad genes, you will have a problem. These things need to be discussed. It doesn't mean that you have to throw this to the sea or to the, to the um, 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 uh, I'll call it to the ocean, but it means it has, these consequences need to be um, uh, seriously considered. You, have, um, you want to improve the health condition of the people, but this shouldn't be at the cost of their happiness in life. Uh, when it comes to embryo selection and aborting deformed fetuses, you need to ask the question what kind of society we want to have. We, we had a seminar in our center in Qatar, and uh, some of the people here were also participating there and giving also papers and discussing. Uh, uh, they raised this question. Uh, uh, if we want to say that if we made genetic tests, tests and we find Down syndrome for one embryo, and we say, okay, you can abort it, it's deformed fetus, um, it would be a difficult life for the, for the prospective child, for the uh, parents, so let's get rid of it because there is no human being. So the question here, do we want to have society without any single uh, child with Down syndrome? Is it bad to have children with Down syndrome? Does this affect the society? We have countries, I think uh, some of the people in the seminar, they mentioned uh, Finland or Iceland. It's one of their targets. They want to have a country without any child of Down syndrome. At least from an Islamic perspective, this can be questioned. And, 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 and it can be a, pro a problem. Having what we call in bioethics vulnerable groups have ethical aims and ethical objectives in order to show the best of the people, ha ha in order to get out your good feelings toward these vulnerable people. If these vulnerable people are not there, what will happen with these emotions? It, it will be problematic. And, and this question needs to be addressed at least. In, in, in this context, they are not. Uh, um, uh, about embryo selection, to choose the good embryo. You can say the good embryo, the, the embryo which doesn't have a disease, but also you can say the good embryo is the good sex of the, of the, of the embryo. And by the way, I don't want to make it a gender issue because I know people, close friends and family members, the woman does not have to have a girl. She wants to have a boy. And it is the husband who has no problem. So I, I please, it's not, it's not a gender issue, but, but it, is, it is a problem of logic. It is a problem of ethics, which goes beyond uh, the, the male and female uh, distinction and divide. To choose a specific sex, e even let's say we want to choose females, is this ethical to choose the, the, the sex of the embryo? Y usually, usually uh, parenthood, one of the key characteristics of parenthood is our unconditional love to our children. 
imagine you are a parent and you will love your children because they happen to be like what you, uh, you like them to be exactly. And if not, you will not love them. Now, with the specially designed babies, you cannot only uh, speak about the sex, but the, the, the eye color, the hair, the, how tall, how short, uh, how thick, how um, thin. And if this didn't happen, for sure, you will be disappointed. Uh, because this is what I want, and if I didn't, uh, but we had a big issue uh, which was discussed in the newspapers in the U.S., uh, uh, New York Times, I think, and other newspapers spoke about um, deaf parents who wanted to have a deaf child. And they made, they made uh, a lot of experiments, they made ads on the newspapers, they paid a lot of money for um, 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 a couple who donated embryo to them in order to make sure that the child will be deaf. And the they had a child and, and he was deaf. So it, 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 this may be an extreme case, but I would ask all of you who are, who are, who are surprised. Are you surprised because the child is deaf? Or are you surprised because the parents made a choice? Why are we shocked? If it is because it is deaf, and then we have problem against deaf people. Is it because they make a choice? What about making choices about choosing the embryos on all whatever ways we are doing? This is just an extreme case which makes us rethink about our positions. How to define quality of life? It's very clear that the discussions speak, uh, are under heavy influence of medicalization. Quality of life is that the people are healthy. That's it. But when we speak about a, a religious tradition like Islam, quality of life has something to do about the dignity which you did not develop yourself, but you got it from God. So the life which will... Uh, undermine this dignity is problematic. There is no quality then. So if we say that embryo from day one, let's say, has the full genetic makeup, which means has also the full uh, spiritual and moral uh, um, uh, structure, which, which is the core of the dignity of the person. So if we put an into this life, we are destroying human dignity, if, even if it is not a human life. I, I don't want to make things more problematic than <laughs> uh, what they are, but I wanted to give you first, of course, uh, something about the landscape of the discussions in the Islamic tradition, and also to be critical about the contemporary, give you some critical hints about the discussions uh, which we have at the moment. Uh, I will not go to the, fi the, the final one, maybe, in your discussions, the issue of five categories in Islam, al-Ahkam al-Khamsa, which give much more diversity than what we have seen till now, uh, in which uh, they usually speak about permissible Im uh, and not permissible. But I will stop here. I thank you very much for listening and for patience, listening to me speaking very quickly. Uh, so I give you the chance now. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you have any questions uh, about what you have to add. Yes, please. The biomedical advancements, which go beyond biomedicine, yeah. Yeah, 
Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yes, the question is about we mentioned uh, we mentioned uh, two challenges: uh, uh, biomedical uh, biomedical sciences and uh, advancements, which whose questions go beyond the, the domain of biomedicine, and the other one is the educational crisis in which we have uh, more or less isolation between uh, sciences and religious studies. And uh, our colleague uh, uh, says that maybe we have another question, which is the issue of methodology. Uh, I, I think there is, uh, if, we, if we use the juristic uh, language, we have a kind of consensus, ijma, that uh, Islamic law suffered stagnancy at least from the t beginning of the 20th century onwards, if not earlier. So we have stagnancy in general, whether it is b b new questions, uh, novel issues, or whatever. If, if you want to know uh, what does Islamic uh, tradition say about uh, management, about business administration, about finance, about media, about psychology, all these things, we have serious problems uh, about them. Uh, biomedicine, it's much more complicated because science is moving very quickly and even ethics in, in, in the secular sense cannot follow uh, what's going on. So the problem became much more magnified. But there is problem in, in, in Islamic studies uh, uh, from the 20th century onward seriously when it comes to the methodology, etc. Quality, quality of the people, uh, of the graduates of, of Islamic studies is problematic. To give you just um, a general uh, idea, to take the example of Al-Azhar University in Egypt, which is one of the old universities uh, which uh, do Islamic studies in the Muslim world. Um, I don't know when exactly, but somewhere in the 20th century, maybe the 40s, the 50s, something like this, um, um, what we call modern faculties were introduced. So besides Sharia, Islamic studies, Arabic language, you had also medicine, uh, engineering, science, etc. And the idea was uh, we want to have the Muslim doctor and the Muslim engineer and the Muslim scientist. It's as if the others are not. But anyhow, the, the idea was this. We want to integrate. We want to integrate. This integration never happened. I, I am a graduate of Al-Azhar University. I know the, the colleagues in, um, in medicine, they get one very little um, booklet uh, about Islamic studies or Islamic ethics, which they uh, maybe never study, whatever. There is nothing about uh, religious studies in their approach. And uh, uh, people in, in uh, faculties of religious studies, they don't get anything about science or whatever. But what happened is that if you, if you follow medicine, if you follow engineering, you have marked for jobs. You will be a physician. So usually Al-Azhar, whose main specialization was religious studies, and the best students will go to Sharia faculties, now they will not. They will go to medicine, they will go to engineering, they will go to science in order to get jobs. And those who will go to Sharia will go Sharia because they have no other option. In Egypt, I don't know the system here in Britain, but anyhow, in the Netherlands, the country in which I lived um, almost half of my life, uh, you, you, if you want to join a faculty, you can always. It, it is not depending on the grades you have got in the high school. In Egypt, it is. So if you want to go to X faculty, and this X faculty takes only 100, so the highest one, grades, um, um, the highest students of grades, 100 will go there, the others will not. So, so I want, everybody want to go to medicine, but medicine cannot take everybody. See, they will take the best, and then we'll go to engineering, and we'll go to science. 
and maybe uh, uh, Sharia was your last choice. But you will go there because you have no other option. So people will go to Sharia, although they don't like to do this study. They are not qualified. And then you will have the problem of the methodology, the quality, etc. You will have serious problems. And yeah, this is part also of the crisis uh, um, uh, that we have. But I have to say that things changed since, since the uh, beginning of this century. I, I'm aware of um, uh, some specializations in Malaysia uh, in which people do a bachelor, uh, from which they can join a master in science or in Islamic studies. So it's an interdisciplinary degree in which they can do both. In Qatar, we have also things like this. We have uh, five specializations in our faculty of Islamic studies. Three of them are in English, and only two they are in Arabic. And we ask from our students to know both Arabic and English. So things are changing. They are, they are not the same as they were before. And we have now a generation of people who have hybrid specializations. And um, because, of inter because interdisciplinarity is now one of the also big advantages in education in general. Also, Islamic studies is benefiting from this. Um, um, I have uh, some of my students who graduated from uh, medicine. Others are, have graduated from Sharia. They are doing a master in Islamic ethics. So th things are changing. They are not the same as they were uh, before. And we hope uh, that the new generation will do things much better than uh, what our generation couldn't. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Two questions. One about um, what what are the objectives of of Islamic bioethics? Is it to make laws? Is it to make guidelines? Is it to inform um, healthcare practitioners? And the second question about who should be on the table besides the two groups we mentioned, religious scholars and biomedical scientists. About the goal, um, uh, there is um, uh, a very well-known statement about uh, bioethicists in general. Uh, if you have three in, in, in an ethics committee, you will have four opinions. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and, and I think Muslim bioethicists do not uh, widely differ uh, from this general, um, uh, sometimes sweeping statement. Um, so I will speak about myself and my own opinion. Uh, and my own opinion about Islamic bioethics, it's part of the objective of Islam, that you lead your life in accordance with the ethical values you believe in as, as an individual. Whether this individual is a physician, is a patient, is a policy maker, it doesn't matter. Islam is a way of life. And in order to uh, lead your life according to the principles you believe in, uh, you need to know these things, including bioethics. So I, I wouldn't say bioethics, I wouldn't make bioethics a, sp a very special case, but I know for sure, uh, uh, and, and I, I, um, I struggle with this with my colleagues in Qatar, they want to have guidelines, and they want to have clear positions, what is possible and what is not possible which is quite problematic for an ethicist <laughs> to come up with uh, such uh, bold um, statements. But I think what will happen in reality is like what happens here in the West. You have an ethical debate, and an ethical debate is usually characterized by diversity. You have different opinions, and then each country, each hospital, each institution, each ministry will pick up what's relevant for them or what they see relevant for them. 
So I would say the ethical discourse should remain as open as possible. As I mentioned here, I mentioned many opinions which I have serious problems with. But people, they have the right to know them. I cannot silence anybody. So I think the ethical discourse should remain as open as possible. But when it comes to the law, which is needed because hospitals cannot run when they have 10 options or, or 20 options, or whatever, they, they, they need to have guidelines. But these guidelines, I would say, shouldn't go beyond the ethical discourse. So if the ethical discourse speaks about three options, I would say Ministry of Health cannot make a fourth one. Otherwise, you will have a problem, you will get backlash from society, you will get into trouble. So ethics is usually uh, characterized by diversity, law not. Law, it's about supremacy of law, everybody has to follow, etc. But this means that law can always change. Uh, so w once the landscape of the ethical debate change, we try things, they do not work. L lawmakers have to be open for this. W um, I know about Qatar, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, people work, working in ethics, they are involved. We are always involved in law drafting process, we give our own opinions, etc. And to be honest, till now they listen. They listen. Uh, I mean they listen, they give you an ear. Not listen that they obey what, they, what you say, but they give an ear, which is a good sign, which is a good sign. Usually lawyers and lawmakers worldwide, uh, they have over self-confidence, if you can say. But uh, till now there is, there is a collaboration, but I would say ethics should be characterized by diversity and this should remain, because what is a marginal opinion today can be very important tomorrow. So no, si no silencing for any opinion, I would say, even if it looks not reasonable for someone like me or for someone like you. About those who participate in, uh, in, uh, in uh, bioethical deliberations nowadays in the Islamic tradition. Bioethics in general, not only Islamic bioethics, uh, is mainly characterized by its interdisciplinary character. And I think Islamic bioethics is not an exception in this regard. What may be different is that Islamic bioethics, so when it comes to Islam, religion plays a great role. This is, this is not the role that religion plays in, in, in Western bioethics because you speak to a society. When I was in the Netherlands, 95% of the people wouldn't classify themselves as religious. In this society, I cannot speak about religious bioethics because you, you cannot stand in the parliament and you say, it, it, it is, it, it, the Bible says this and the Quran says this, so it is allowed or forbidden. You will be speaking to yourself. So you need to, to, to be mirroring the society and sensitive of what's going on in the society. In the Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries, especially in a region like, uh, like, like um, the Gulf countries, and I would say this holds true for Muslim minorities living um, elsewhere in the world, they find religion important. So you cannot force them, because this happens sometimes, that out of modernizing projects, so we want to make these people liberal, we want to make them modern, uh, we want to enlighten them. So you uh, fall into bioethical paternalism. Uh, this is problematic. So when it comes to Islamic bioethics, religion is important. So religious scholars and specialists in religious studies should be there and should play an important role, which is not the case in general bioethics. Uh, we have the, the scientists. This should be the case until we have uh, specialists in Islamic studies who know also science and medicine. As a bioethicist, you don't have to be physician to do bioethics. This is not happening also in the West. You should have first-hand information, uh, basics, so that you can understand the issue at hand, but you don't have to be a specialist. But social scientists are extremely missing in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the meantime. Um, and I would say also other, other uh, 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 groups should happen. For instance, patients should be there. If you want to have public engagement, you should have people who advocate for patients, etc. <coughs> I'm trying to introduce this at the moment, which I think will take time to have patients and families, etc., because it has something to do with the, um, with the public sphere, with the public sphere. It means that everybody should have a word. And in many Muslim majority countries, if not all of them, not everybody has a voice. 
and the majority of the people, they don't have even a voice. Uh, it's just a couple of people who have a voice and everybody should listen because they are the best who know everything about everything and you just have to listen. And if you say anything, you will end up either as a did or in the prison. Uh, that's it, or a camp concentration. So, so this is a problem. So to say that give voice to the patients, and by the way, this is not only by politicians. I have discovered that at, at the management level, so uh, if, if, you are, if you are the manager, you will suppress the people under you. And if you are a dean, you will suppress the faculty members. It, it, there is a culture, and, and it's a serious problem. And I have realized that some people, they like to be treated this way, which is a serious. So it's not only the problem of the managers and the bosses, but also the grassroots people. But, but this is a serious issue which has to do with society, which will need a lot of work in the future, I suppose. Yes. So th the question is about the, the absence of patients. Maybe it has to do with epistemological issues that jurists usually do not consider the patient's narrative. In the pre-modern literature, it's completely the opposite. So in the, in the pre-modern literature, there is a legal maxim, قاعده فقهيه, لا يجوز لأحد أن يتصرف في جسد غيره إلا بإذنه. So as a physician, you cannot intervene in my body without my consent. This is a pre-modern, cl very classical uh, legal rule. Nobody can touch, nobody can touch your body without your consent. Why? Because you are the trustee. God didn't entrust the physician about your body, but he entrusted you. So in many, many rulings, like for instance, fasting. If I am sick, um, I have a concession that I don't fast. How do you know that you are sick? Nowadays, if you ask any religious scholar, we'll see, I have to ask the physician. In the pre-modern time, no. They will say the best one who can say is the patient himself because he has experience. He knows what makes him sick and he knows what doesn't make him sick. So, so epistemologically, I, think, I don't think this was a problem in the pre-modern time. It is a problem in the modern time because of the medicalization process in, in the bioethical discourse in the Islamic tradition and because of the lack of freedom in society in general, at least many societies. Yes, please. Do we have time to take more questions, or shall we make this the last question? Yeah? Yes, please. Anyhow, you can ask your question. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. Uh, the question is about uh, um, uh, my involvement with this field and how it developed uh, my um, reflection about this. Uh, should we regret that it went this way? Uh, was this not the good thing to do? And uh, I'll be very honest about this. I think the introduction of the collective approach uh, to um, Islamic bioethics in the modern time from the 1980s onwards, personally, I think it's one of the big achievements in the Islamic tradition in general, not just in Islamic bioethics. And I cannot imagine that we would have been standing today to uh, speak about our critical remarks about the tradition without this tradition. So I, I can imagine if we were 
the same people who were uh, now, we were back in the 1980s, maybe we will think the same way. And maybe we will not do even as good as they did. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important improvement, very, very important improvement. And it would have been quite dangerous if we didn't have the collective reasoning. Uh, I would say this has saved the authority of religious scholars. It would have completely disappeared. And it doesn't matter, but this is something personal. Maybe I'm biased because I'm a graduate of Al-Azhar, so I can, be, I, can take, I can take the side of religious scholars. But anyhow, I'm aware of this bias. I think that if, we, if, if the religious scholars lost their authority, and this could have happened if, if, if they didn't move to and accept the shared authority with the physicians, uh, if, if we lost the authority of the religious scholars, and we didn't have an alternative authority, it would have been anarchy. And, and we wouldn't have answers for our questions, and I don't know what would have happened. So uh, was it a good thing to, um, that it happened? I think it was, I think it was. Does this mean that everything is perfect? And no, of course not, of course not. And, and the fact that we do now things in order to improve what happened, it doesn't necessarily mean that what happened was completely wrong. There are for sure things which went wrong in this, like for instance, involving only physicians is a problem. Uh, 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 but it is also a matter of development, a matter of development that you, you come to a specific phase and then you have to come up with new questions and new things so that you can innovate and you can improve the situation. Otherwise, um, there will be stagnancy and there will be a problem. So I think there is a need now to have new moves, new questions, to, to approach things differently and to uh, think critically about what happened. This is a necessity. This is a necessity. And I can tell you, unfortunately, some, maybe many, of the participants of, from the 1980s till now are not happy uh, with these new moves, etc. Some of them they don't like and they think it should continue like what it is. Uh, but this is life. People should have different perspectives and um, uh, we should make things open for people and people should choose uh, what, is, um, uh, what is good for them. Uh, and I think the participants in this field in the 1980s, they made something different. And for sure, many religious scholars were not happy to have physicians on the table with them. And now it is more or less accepted. This is how life happens. Yeah, so I, I, I would see it as improvement, development, uh, rather than that it was something completely um, um, counterproductive. No, I, I, I would not say it th this way, because I see, I see even the pre-modern tradition extremely relevant and important. And there are things in the pre-modern tradition which are, to my mind, amazing. Uh, the, um, how, how, how creative, how innovative, how critical people are. It's, uh, it's something to learn from. But the problem is, uh, as Muhammad Abdu uh, once mentioned, uh, the, the problem in the Islamic tradition is happening because we either uh, worship the tradition so we think the interpretations of these religious scholars is part of the revelation. It's like the Quran and Sunnah. Or we have no respect whatsoever to them. This is the problem. So uh, either we, we, we make it sacrosanct, we make it sacred, the tradition, or we just throw it completely away. I don't think either way, I, I do agree with Muhammad Abdu in this regard. We should, we should critically, critically think about what happened and how to develop uh, in the future. Wallahu alam. Yeah? Okay. I'm so sorry for this. If you have any questions, here is my, um, here is my email. You can always email me. You can ask me after we finish. And, huh? Oh, or, or yes, you can join us tomorrow and after tomorrow.